Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Human Rights Institute podcast. I have a very special guest with me, one of my favorite professors and one of the most kindest human beings I've ever met. And I'm going to let her introduce herself. <laughs> Hassan, thank you so much. Uh, so I am Loretta Farrell. I'm the director of the Human Rights Institute here at Kane University. Um, I, uh, in addition to running the HRI, as, as Hassan mentioned, I do teach uh, one class a semester. Usually it's focused on human rights and social justice. And I was really lucky to have had Hassan in uh, my class last spring. Um, and we can probably talk a little bit more about that <clears throat> later because it was certainly an unusual semester. Very for- unusual, very unusual. So, um, I thought I would share a little bit about myself. Um, So I grew up, um, I actually grew up in Queens and then spent a part of my life on Long Island, but I grew up Irish Catholic. And I share that because um, I think for for many of us who grew up in that tradition, social justice is a really important part of who we are, whether it's serving the church or the greater community, Um, It's just kind of built into our DNA. And I certainly think that that's part of what has brought me to where I am today. Um, I think that it's really important. And and this is something I've learned um, throughout my life, both from personal experience, being the person who was voiceless, as well as the person who needed to use their voice for somebody else, that it really is important to stand up for what you believe in and to give a voice for those who, for whatever reason, aren't able to use their own. So, um, so that's, you know, the, the quick version of how it is I ended up doing what I do. Um, And I want to tell you that I really just love that, um, that I get to do this and that I get to do this here at Kane. So many human rights institutes um, throughout our country are based either in law schools or graduate schools. So undergraduate students really don't have the opportunity to kind of kind of get their hands dirty in the social justice movement unless they've brought that experience with them. Um, so here at Kane, we introduce students to human rights and social justice before they are officially enrolled. We do it through new student orientation. They visit the HRI. We talk about the projects that are important to us and why we do what we do. Um, And then we incorporate this also into what we call our T2K or Transition to Cane classes. It's sort of an extended orientation that helps new students become um, accustomed to and familiar with the ins and outs of a large um, urban institution, um, but also um, grounds them in the concept of, of service. So um, it's, it's fun. I get to, to work with students from the time that they first step foot on campus um, all through, um, and, and Hassan is a part of that, through graduation and beyond. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hassan graduated a year ago? Yep, a year ago. I think I think it's it's not officially a year, but I think it's a year ago. <laughs> and I think and I truly think I think you said something that's so important that like you don't see institutes like you basically see it in prestigious colleges where they get all the funding, they get all the money. But we have one. I think that's what makes Kane so special. We have one right by the library, you know, with the signs out. We have a gallery for it. And I want you to just explain to people like what's so important about this incident and can you give a little glimpse of the gallery part of it as well sure sure so let me start with a little history about the hri um which actually goes back to holocaust which is you'll you'll understand when i when <laughs> so after the holocaust and after people after jews who had been in internment camps, um, they, they, many of them moved to displaced persons camps and then eventually settled into a country of, of their own. Many left Europe and, and came to Canada, to the United States, to Israel. A number of um, Holocaust survivors came and settled in Elizabeth, which if you know where Cain is, we're really right on the border of Union and Elizabeth. Mm. So there is a large 
Orthodox Jewish community right in the heart of Elizabeth um, within a stone's throw of, of the Institute. And um, in, I wanna say the early 1980s, then Governor Kane signed legislation um, requiring that New Jersey high schools teach about the Holocaust in their curriculum. Um, mm. That was all great until teachers looked at one another and said, okay, but we don't really have the tools that we need to be able to do that. We didn't study the Holocaust in depth. We don't, don't know necessarily how to build age appropriate lessons and curricula. Um, so a group of survivors from Elizabeth stepped up and, and they created the Holocaust Research wow. at Kane. And among those um, survivors, and um, I always tell this story when I'm doing my, my tours, um, we had three members of Schindler's List. Wow. Um, real estate, many of, most of them were real estate developers. And um, these three members formed a company together and they made sure that in every development that they built, whether it was residential or commercial, mm -hmm. there was a street that was named Schindler, um, wow. recognized the role that he played in saving them and their families. Um, we also had a member of the Bielski Brigade. The Bielski Brigade was from, I believe it was Belarus, mm -hmm. and they lived in the woods for two years. They would move from sort of encampment to encampment um, to not only protect themselves from, mm -hmm. from the Nazis, but also to fight against them. And the incredible thing about the Bielski Brigade is that they were the only um, partisan group that allowed women full participation. Wow. So women would fight, women had guns. Um, their story was told in the movie Defiance. Um, mm -hmm. I was just thinking of it. I'm like, I know I've seen this before. Yeah. Wow. It's um, it's really amazing. And um, and one of the members of the brigade was Ray Kushner, who was one of our founders. Wow. So, you know, we are steeped in the the story and the history of of the Holocaust. So as time went on and um, social justice became to be um, a more more came to the forefront and people wanted to look at other issues. They said, you know, what, what about, um, you know, Save Darfur? What about Never Again? Mm -hmm. about some of the other atrocities that are happening around the world. Um, these survivors stepped up one more time and said, we are going to create a human rights institute wow. that will focus on contemporary social justice issues. Mm -hmm. So we were founded in 2008. Um, uh, we built an a, a wing onto the library. Um, and we are really centrally located on our union campus. It's very accessible. It's very easy to be there. It's very open. Um, I have opened That's the beautiful to student groups, um, to random students who want to study. Uh, when pre pandemic, we always had coffee, tea, water, food mm -hmm. for anybody who, who wanted to buy. Um, one of the, the really nice pieces of the Institute is our human rights gallery. Um, and that takes up the entire first floor of, of the Institute. And we host exhibits there. We host um, typically two a year, one in the spring semester and one in the fall semester. Mm -hmm. Focus on, on contemporary social justice issues or even sometimes historical issues, but with a contemporary um, component to them. So for instance, uh, a, a couple of years ago, and I've kind of lost track of time on this one, we hosted an exhibit on Ireland's great hunger. I was there for that one. I was oh, there. Was that was, I think, just such a spectacular collection of paintings and sculptures that had been, that were on loan to us from the Great Hunger Museum and, um, at Quinnipiac University, but we tied that that exhibit into issues of immigration and emigration, forced um, uh, well, forced immigration, but also issues related to hunger. And that was the semester that we opened our food pantry and talked mm. about hunger as a human right. And so, I just have to say that food pan the food pantry when it was opened, I didn't know about the 
the effects of hunger on college students the way it had. And I remember, I forgot the woman's name that came in to speak to us. I, I went to her, um, what was her name? She came in to speak, you know, she was part of the Human Rights Summit as well, you know, speaking about the issue of hunger. And she talked about how college students are starving on, in their campuses, you know, in their dorms. And I've, I've heard stories from our friends where they're like, hey, we don't have any food on campus. We don't want to go to the cafeteria. Um, I'm out of, you know, the the cougar bucks that they used to use. Mm-hmm. And I've actually seen, you know, the effects of how effective food pantries can be to have on campus. So I like, it was amazing, you know, to see that open up there. And do you remember the lady's name? I, I forgot her name. Um, we, we had three speakers that year at the conference. So we had Karen Washington, who's a uh, black female urban farmer. Karen Washington. Karen Washington, she, and, she um, was the one that like blew my mind about it, all of it. Yeah, yeah. And she like, started a community farm in, in the Bronx. Wow. Um, now is part of a collective in uh, the Hudson Valley. Um, but in, and she's, she's so powerful. We mm-hmm. also, Lee Randall, who is a Kane graduate, who talked about food deserts in Elizabeth and how it's so much easier to, to get, um, food that is not nutritious. I mean, the cheapest food is probably the food that is worst for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and in places like Elizabeth and Newark and, and other urban centers, it's often difficult to get to a grocery store if in fact there is even a grocery, grocery store, store. Mm-hmm. in the community. And if you rely on public transportation, you can only buy so much at one time because you've got to carry it on the mm-hmm. train bus or the subway. So it was a really important lesson to share with our students. And I think, um, you know, in, in doing so, we also realized the impact of hunger um, mm-hmm. on student performance. If you, are, if you are hungry, it's hard to concentrate. And if you have to make the decision about whether you're going 100%. to buy or books, everything suffers. So mm. and part of what we do at the Human Rights Institute is that We try to make it not just sort of this esoteric conversation that we have at one point in time and then it goes away, Mm. but to be real hands-on, real transformate, really transformational, something that stays with us forever. Mm. So even though we are remote right now, Cougar Pantry is still serving Kane students. I love that. We're dealing with, with food insecurity. And then last semester, well, actually the entire 2020 year, because we sort of got a little upended um, with COVID, we really focused on um, voting rights and and the ability and necessity to use your voice. Mm -hmm. Um, So we started, and and this was Hassan's last semester, Mm -hmm. started by doing debate parties and- uh, Watching the elections. Parties (laughs) and and conversations about, about issues Hassan at the time was the uh, president of the United Nations mm-hmm. Association of USA at, at Kane, and the group would hold these great news nights, mm-hmm. HRI, where we would have CNN, MSNBC, Fox, all of them. and Al Jazeera yeah. on at the same time. So we could see how different media outlets um, presented the same topics. Mm-hmm. Important. Uh, lesson for our, our students to learn. Um, once remote in the in the spring of 2020, we we had to postpone our human rights conference, which typically takes takes place in March. But that really worked to our advantage because we were able to extend the conversation about voting rights through the fall semester and through the presidential election. Mm-hmm. And and we had a group of students, and I, I brought Hassan back for this too. Mm-hmm who formed our Cougar voting squad. Um, and they went out um, virtually for the most part and registered almost 2000 students to, to vote and then helped the entire Kane community figure out how to vote in this last election because it was so different from anything any of us had ever experienced before. And I truly loved that. And I think you, you bring up another point. It's like, why is this so important to talk about you know, not just human rights. I feel like the Human Rights Institute embodies everything and it embodies. And I've noticed that every time we have a summit, you know, we have the Human Rights 
summit. I keep changing up the words summit. We all, we take something from it every time when we hold it, for example, you know, when it was the food awareness and we, we have the food pantry now, it's, it's never changed. You know, the voting rights, we still include voting rights discussions. We still, you know, if someone wants to learn how to vote, they can still come to me. It's so ingrained in my head now, you know, through the voting squad and the presentations that you gave us to, you know, go out and help different students discuss. And I remember going to different classes at Kane University and the professors would be listening. And some of the students didn't even know, oh, that's a regulation. Oh, I can't vote yet. Or, oh, I could vote. Or they didn't know they could vote. And yeah. I just want to ask you, why is that so important to to discuss with the youth and discuss with students, discuss with people about just being proactive citizens in the United States and beyond. Well, I, I think for, for a couple of reasons. Um, and, you know, so, so in all transparency, his son sort of gave me a list of, of questions that we might cover. <laughs> and one of them was how has the world changed since, since you were younger? Mm-hmm. And I grew up in the, in the sixties and seventies. So it's changed a lot. But I think the biggest way that it changed is that when I was growing up, there were there were a significant number of families where um, mom and dad were were still married, living in one house. Dad went out to work. Mom stayed home. Mm. And so we um, and we lived in a community. We, we didn't move around a lot, and mm. they all sort of helped to raise everybody else's kids. And so we were imbued with, first of all, this sense of community, um, but this also sense of civic responsibility. Um, Election day was always a holiday. Mm. The schools were closed and companies were closed. And my mom and my dad would walk us down to the polls and we would go in and we would watch them vote. Mm. Um, And unfortunately with the way that society has evolved and with how expensive it has become to raise families, it's really a luxury to have only one parent working and one parent staying mm. home. So, you know, to it's and election day is not a, a, a mandatory holiday. It's not a federal holiday. Mm. People have to work. So, you know, I would go before work to, to vote or I would go after work to vote. So you're not bring if you have children, you're not bringing them with you. So they're mm. not bringing this civic lesson as part of their day to day life when they are growing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that part of our job as educators is to not only help you become book smart, but to help you become responsible. Um, civically conscious adults. So we need to talk about these, these kinds of, of issues um, because if we're not talking about them on our college campus, we are spending so much time um, and, and particularly with our students, you know, you're, you're not only going to school, but you're working sometimes one of your jobs, you're helping to watch younger siblings or grandparents. So, um, we it, it's in, if we're if we don't do it who's going to do it exactly and that and i think that last election i think st- the student vote and like the youth voting was so important and it was important in every election that happens but it was more emphasized even more now because you know a lot of misinformation was going on with the last election and a lot of things were you know that were continuing to happen but i think a lot of people didn't recognize how important their vote was until mm-hmm. you know the last administration and that is something that started resonating even more and more with students and t- students are being proactive. And like you said, if we if we don't teach, you know, not just the book smart, how to be a socially engaged and, you know, be proactive, we're the ones that can make a difference. You know, there's some, we're the next generation. You know, I don't like to admit it, but I'm part of Generation Z. Z and, you know, I always think I'm a millennial, but I'm not. Um, but we're like the next, you know. We're those we're the kids that are trying to change the boat. You know, we're trying we're trying to trying to make a difference. For example, after all the shootings that happened in schools, it was students that were speaking about, OK, we need to change the laws when it comes to, you know, uh, bearing arms. We need to change the laws when it comes to 
guns and we need to change the regulations and the policies of what how what states can regulate you know what are you know weapons that people can have and i thought that was so crucial the students were making that difference and i think that's where the human rights institute is so important you know they should be an institute in every university every college wouldn't that be wonderful wouldn't it it would be amazing so I, I need to share this story. Um, the the spring that Hassan was in my class, I had seven students enrolled in in justice <laughs> and human rights, which is a, a pretty big group Huge of class. people for this kind of conversation. And for the most part, they were traditionally aged, somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25. And as we would talk about different social justice issues, students would be like, well, how come the boomers are, are, are relying on us to do it? And how come the boomers and how come the boomers and I finally was like guys I'm a boomer and I gotta tell you I'm tired Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't have the same level of energy that I had I was active when I was younger Mm -hmm. and now I need to 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 as John F. Kennedy said I need to pass that torch to the next generation and okay I'm skipping a couple of generations by passing it to you all but somebody has to be there Mm -hmm. to take that social justice mantle Mm. Um, but if, if I don't teach you, if I don't give you the tools, then you don't know what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give, sorry to cut you off. What advice would you give students who want to make a difference and they think, Hey, you know, I can't make a difference because I don't have the platform or the tool. And I think, what advice would you give those students that think, Hey, the only way I can make a difference is if I'm like recognized. The only ways I can make a difference is if I'm if I need to be on CNN or something. What would you tell them? What's one advice where a student can make a difference? You know, you know, I would say that um, first of all, everybody should everybody should read. Mm. Everybody should read, and everybody should be open to different points of view. Um, It's really important to know what um, different perspectives are and then take that all in and help you to develop your own perspective. Mm. You know, anybody who's a leader today really started off as just a kid someplace. Mm. Um, And and even if you look at at the Parkland kids who are the ones who are are responsible for March for Our Lives and Mm -hmm not only so much of the, the um, gun legislation, but also so much of um, motivating young people to, to vote. Mm-hmm. You know, on February 13th, they were nobody. And on February 14th, they were unfortunately thrust into um, the, the, the limelight. And um, you know these were regular kids going about their regular days, living in Florida. Wow riding their bikes, surfing, thinking about going off to college, but, but they were kids. And all of a sudden they just started talking and they kept talking until finally people listened to them. Now they did their homework. They absolutely (laughs) did their homework. So they knew what they were talking about, but you know, God, God help that none of us have to experience a school shooting in order for us to find our voice and to find our platform. 100%. There are so many opportunities for us to, to, to share and to talk. And even if it's just within your, your group of friends or your family or your neighbors, um, we only learn when we are exposed to new things. Mm-hmm. So expose others to new things they'll learn and and you'll learn at the same time. And I think that's something that happens all the time at the Human Rights Institute. It's the, I think the most important thing you said, have that, you know, is that conversation. And I said to you, I think the, I was like, why I love the human rights? Cause we're having those conversations that, okay, if you're not having that, but you, you know, you have a spot to have those conversation about, mm-hmm. if you're not having it in your classroom, you have the Institute that, you know, you could have those conversations about. And I remember Patrick, one of our other, you know, one of my colleagues were one of my close friends from HRI who graduated with me. We would have different conversations on so many diverse topics. 
And once you have those conversations, it leads to action sometimes. You know, it will lead to a different thing happening. You know, um, Patrick was president of PRISM. And, you know, that was an LGBTQ, you know, advocacy club. And we wanted to bring awareness to LGBTQ rights. And I thought that was so important. And like, just out of a conversation, so many different things could happen. And like you said, I was president of the United Nations Association. And we would come to HRI and we would just get even more motivated seeing what was going to happen in the summit or the convention, seeing, you know, all these speakers coming in, like, what can we discuss? And I think that is so crucial is for people to have conversations and to read about issues that are happening around the world and even in their home country. And, you know, the story of yours and Patrick's friendship, I think, really highlights why the HRI is so important. So I truly believe it. And, you know, I've had conversations with each of you about this. Um, you were different majors. You were involved in different things. Mm -hmm. You different cultures your paths had never really crossed no. <laughs> before you came to the HRI and that's one of the things that I think is is sort of this really hidden value of the HRI at Kane is that we bring together students who probably wouldn't find one another otherwise mm -hmm. and we are we're a safe place to have conversations and me too. I mean, some of the questions that I would ask you guys, I didn't know very much about Islam and mm -hmm. you're teaching me and, and, you know, Patrick had, had social justice awareness of issues that I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we, we come together and we expand our knowledge and we expand our, our compassion. And what I really love is that this wasn't a one and done for you guys. Mm -hmm. And for those of you out there, Patrick and Hassan and I try to Zoom at least once a month just to <laughs> catch up. And it's it's wild. You know, I'm here at Kane, Hassan's at Rutgers, Patrick's in Indiana. All the way to Indiana. Still staying together. I think I think it's it's that is a, honestly just one wonderful story. And I think there's so many different students that have come together because of the HRI. And it's just like when you're younger, it, it, it creates the foundation of like, you know, I truly believe creates the foundation of how you're going to be when you're older. And you know, if you're proactive now, you're going to instill those habits. Even in your, if you have kids, even in your kids or, you know, have the habit within yourself. And I think my, you know, just a fun question. Now, what was your favorite lesson that you learned when you were younger? You know, learning through, you know, universities. What was your favorite lesson? Wow. My favorite lesson. Mm -hmm. Gosh. You know, I, I, I feel like I learned so many, but um, one, of, one of, I think the most important lessons I learned is that um, at our core, we're really all the same and we want the same things. Mm -hmm. um, we, may, um, we may praise God in different ways. We may eat different foods. We may wear different clothing. But at the end of the day, we want to be loved. We want to be comforted. We want to belong. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We want to connect. Um, and, and, you know, my, my youth, Queens, was a very changing community as I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went off to to college where I was exposed to people who um, had very different life experiences than, than me. And then I've been incredibly fortunate to travel and to travel to some really um, kind of far-flung places. You know, I've been to China, I've been to Israel, wow. I've been to Macedonia. Um, so I've been to Turkey. So, so I've learned things that I wouldn't I wouldn't have learned and I wouldn't have an appreciation for had I not left the U.S. So, you know, here in the U.S., we're thinking, wow, we're 250 or whatever years old and, you know, we're such an old country. And then I go to China and, you know, we're, we're visiting temples and seeing artwork that had been created thousands of years before. Mm -hmm. so, um it really broadened my perspective and I was very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And if you guys hear uh, 
Piper in the back. That's Loretta's dog. Uh, Sorry. She's Hi, amazing. Hello? She's amazing. <laughs> she's her, she's she her own guest She on being a part of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my last question is, Loretta, is how can students get involved with the HRI now? You know, we're in this, you know, we're in this online spectrum now where we're everything's online. I don't think we'll be back in school for a while. And what are ways that, you know, students that want to be involved with HRI, you know, get involved, come with different organizations? How can they contact you? How can they talk to you? Sure. So, I, you know, the easiest thing to do is to, to email, and that's L-A-F-A-R-R-E-L at cane.edu. Um, but, you know, check out Cougar Link and see what events we have coming up. We've got... Um, Two, two big ones. We've done a couple of things. We did an inauguration watch party, um, actually, and that was on campus um, for students who, who live on campus. But um, we've got a, a, our art exhibit opening on February 25th. It's called Capturing Change. And a, a group of local artists took photographs um, of wow. the Black Lives Matter protests that happened over the summer. And so a group of them are going to be um, with us uh, at 3.30 on the 25th um, to talk about what, um, what their photographs mean and why they felt compelled to be a part of this. And then on March 18th, we've got a young woman named Tony Smith Thompson, who's gonna be talking to us about the path from protest to participation. And um, I can pretty much guarantee that 99% that of you have never heard of her. Mm kind of a shame because she was Colin Kaepernick before he was Colin Kaepernick. Wow. And that, I mean, she was a, um, a, a, high, a college basketball player um, during the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, and she was protesting our involvement by turning her back during the national anthem during mm -hmm. basketball games. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. so, so those are our two big events right now. Huge. But can I and Cougar Link watch certainly follow us on our social media um at twitter our handle is at kane hri what are we on instagram hri same it's the same thing as a twitter handle same thing yeah. as, and i will be putting the link up on our youtube on our instagram follow us on everything and this was a great way to have the first episode so thank you Dr. Loretta Farrell, the director of the Human Rights Institute. And thank you, Hassan. And it was amazing speaking to you. And I hope you guys, you know, tune in for the next episode. Hopefully we might have Patrick and some more people. So I think that'd be great. Thank you guys. And thank you. Bye-bye.